Greetings! I am Herbert Erpeter, and today I'm going to assemble this 156th scale or 28mm scale plastic Cromwell made by Warlord Games, or more correctly made by Atalari for Warlord for their game Bolt Action, though you could use it for any 28mm scale game you like. Don't worry, I won't tell Warlord. On the front of the box there's a pretty nice picture of an assembled and painted Cromwell blasting away at some perilous foe. Pretty cool, though the muzzle flash is not included in the kit. On the back of the box there are a couple of paragraphs with some historical information on the Cromwell, an image of the included decal sheet and some pictures of painted examples of this model, one of which is a winter version with whitewash and covered in snow. This offers some interesting ideas for when you get to painting the tank. There are also a couple of bubbles to show the optional commander figure and hedgerow cutter. Inside the box there are two sprues, the first of which contains mostly hull components, like, well, the upper hull, which is pretty well detailed with tools and ropes and such moulded on. The tracks, which have some pretty nicely detailed treads, the inside of the tracks are also detailed, which is nice. There are also some hatches, toe points and shackles, vision devices, antennas and of course the lower hull, which has some detailing in the form of what I assume to be access panels moulded into the part. The other sprue, strangely enough, contains the rest of the parts. The wheels and hull side parts are for the most part pretty good looking, though I'm not a big fan of the wheels being a single solid piece like they are. There should be a space between the wheels where the track guide part goes. Maybe it won't be so obvious when the model is completed. Other than that, there are turret sides, front and rear, and the optional commander. The commander is actually quite nice looking in my opinion. He's rather well detailed, though he does have a fair bit of flashing, particularly around his head. It's nothing that can't be fixed with a little bit of work though. There are all kinds of other bits and pieces on this sprue too. All the parts are quite well detailed and seem to be error free. They do suffer from some flash and mould lines here and there, but they're not too bad at all. In addition to the sprues in the box, we find this leaflet with assembly instructions. It's pretty simply laid out and easy enough to follow, though there are some areas where it's a little bit vague and not entirely clear. Clear. With a little bit of common sense and looking at pictures of the assembled model, it's very easy to get the model built. Also we find this decal sheet which has a nice variety of markings, though the separate Warlord decal set for British vehicles I bought a while ago has many more options and I will probably use those instead. I begin assembly with the track sets, as the instructions suggest. Assembling the tracks as labelled in the instructions would have resulted in the lower track pieces having the remnants of the sprue gates visible, so I simply switched parts 41 and 42 so the blemished parts would be facing inwards rather than outwards. I don't think this detracts from the model at all, and it meant I didn't have to bother cleaning up the tracks with my knife. These tracks do look a little bit like the Plastic Soldier Company track assemblies that I've never liked, so I was a bit wary of them. But in this case they don't seem to be too bad. You can see they glue together quite easily. The join at the front and rear of the tracks isn't too obvious and they went together without much trouble at all. I guess this design is an easy way for them to get detail on both sides of the treads, which isn't a bad thing. The track sets don't look too bad at all. Now to attach them to the lower hull. This is pretty easy, though I did have to trim a fair bit of flash from the lower hull, particularly in the slots that guide the track parts. No big deal though, simply glue the track assemblies into place. The drive sprocket goes towards the rear as indicated on the instruction leaflet, though you can't put them on the wrong side without significant effort anyway. You want to try to get the top of the lower hull part and the top of the track part to be flush with each other to allow the hull top to fit properly. My right track part was a little bit bent. I guess that's kind of a tradition for Warlord. All of their resin track sets seem to come bent. Fortunately, the plastic version is much easier to deal with. Just glue it into place and apply pressure to keep it straight while the glue sets. Now to start on the hull top. I don't know why, but the sprue gates holding the hull top part in place seemed really wide and left pretty big marks. There was also some flash along a few of the edges. Easy enough to clean up though, so it's not really a big deal. It doesn't seem to matter much in what order you attach the external details, and if it does, the instructions don't mention it. I'm not entirely sure why the instructions don't seem to suggest joining the upper and lower hull parts until after you've stuck on a bunch of details. I guess the best reason I can think of is to be able to glue the parts in from behind. It keeps you from potentially messing up the tank's exterior with spilled glue, so I did that where I could. I began adding details to the hull with the upper frontal plate. There are two little pins on the bottom to guide it perfectly into place. Next, I carefully apply the glue to attach this angled vent cover thing, at least that's what I think it is, to the side of the engine deck. It slots into place easily using a pair of holes to guide it. I am careful with the glue here to avoid getting it onto the upper engine deck and making a mess. 
There is of course another one of these for the right side of the vehicle. This one has a large bar or some kind of wrench or something moulded onto it. Then this piece which I think is some kind of armoured air intake cover which can be glued into place. Whatever it is, the part should be attached with the slight angle sloping upwards towards the front of the tank. Now let's add some hatches. Bitches love hatches. The driver's hatch comprises two parts. The smaller part should be glued into the right side of the opening, closest to the side of the tank, while the larger half should obviously go on the left side towards the centre of the vehicle. I've chosen to model this closed, but open is also a good option. These hatches don't have much detail on the outside, but I think that's fairly realistic. Now onto a more interesting hatch. The hull machine gunner's hatch can also be modelled open, and I've chosen to have mine open just a little bit. Having it open all the way would make it obvious that there's just a wall inside the hatch. I think it looks pretty cool slightly ajar as though the gunner wants just a little bit of air. If you build a few of these models this might be a nice subtle way to quickly tell the hulls apart, otherwise it's just a nice detail to add some interest and variety. The hull machine gunner is going to need more than just a hatch, so let's give him a gun to fire. This part is keyed so it only fits the correct way up. It does have a little bit of wiggle room so you can aim it slightly up or down or to the side or whatever. I added a little bit of extra glue inside to keep it secure. Next, applying the glue from the inside of the hull part, I attach these towing shackles. This potentially could have been a bit messy had I put the glue on the outside of the hull. The towing shackle parts were quite fiddly to get into place with my fat fingers. I couldn't find my tweezers so I used my knife to gently manoeuvre the parts into place being careful to avoid making any scratches in the plastic and making sure the parts were positioned nice and straight. I think these shackle parts look quite good. Again gluing from the inside, I attach the headlamps. These are fiddly tiny parts, but they are kind of keyed so they will only go into the correct depth. They can still be placed at an odd angle though, so get them as straight and forward facing as you can. Next, I add the three hull mounted vision devices. All three parts are the same. The bow gunner gets one that faces forwards, while the driver gets two. It looks to me as though one should be placed facing forwards and the other to the left a little bit. I'm not entirely sure if these parts rotated or not, but I think they do so I'm not entirely sure if their positioning matters all that much. A little note here, the holes for the next step weren't properly drilled out. To remedy this I took my drill and as you do with a drill, drilled out the holes properly. I tidied up the hole a little bit with my knife. Of course we hope all the holes that are meant to be there are in fact there, but it's very simple to correct them if they aren't. There we go, all the holes ready for the next step, which is to attach these headlight protection bars. This part was a little bit fiddly. There are no spares for these or any other parts in the kit really, so do be careful with them both when removing them from the sprue and when cleaning up the little burr left behind after clipping them from the sprue. I clean them up with a very fine file rather than risk breaking them with my knife. I don't normally like to use these files for cleaning up parts because they tend to leave little scratches behind and I feel a knife works a little bit better. I glue these parts from the inside and then the bars more or less just slot into place. The longer leg should be placed towards the front of the tank. Tweezers would be great for this if I could find them, though they were pretty easy to get into place without the aid of tweezers. It's just a matter of fiddling with them until both protective bars for each headlamp are relatively straight. The next step requires that both the hull components be glued together, so I do that. The hull parts do slot together very easily, though you might find there is a bit of a gap at the front of the hull. Just hold the parts together tightly so the gap isn't visible while the glue begins to set up. The front of the lower hull does look to have a few too many gaps and lines to me, but it's not too bad and it should look fine once the model is painted. Next we can attach the lower rear hull part. When test fitting this, as all parts should be test fitted, I discovered that the guide holes for this part were too small, so I gently widened them with my knife. Then it's just a matter of slotting the part into position, no problem at all. I then glue in the two rear towing shackles. I did this now just on the off chance that the rest of the rear hull details make it a little bit harder to get them into position. While I was at it I figured I might as well see to the lower frontal hull. It was quite appealing to attach the optional hedgerow cutter, after all it would nicely hide some of the gaps you can see in the front of the hull. Not only that, but it does look pretty cool. I do have some other uses for that part in mind though, so I'm opting to leave it off this model. The other choice is more towing shackles. Not that it's a bad choice, after all, it's the choice I went with. These shackle parts are numbered differently on the sprue to the other four. They do look the same on the front, but they have a differently shaped guide pin on the back to fit into the slots in the front of the lower hull. Just as with the rest of the shackles, be sure to position these as straight as you can. I feel they do improve the look of the front of the tank a little bit. I then return to the rear of the tank and attach this box-like part. This is positioned with the opening towards the top. I think the entire box is the exhaust system. Over the top of the opening in the box we glue 
this grille. Make sure that you place this part with the tiny hinges facing rearwards away from the vehicle. The grille has two protrusions at either end. These are to guide the positioning of this cowl, which has appropriate recesses on the side that joins the tank. It is really simple to glue this part into position. It is of course optional, but I think Cromwell's looks so much cooler with the cowl. I'm not sure why, they just do. And with that, the hull is complete. Now onto the turret. The turret is pretty quick and easy to put together. Start with the central core part of the turret and then glue all the side parts into place. It's pretty obvious which turret sides go where. This is the right hand side of the turret. You can see that the left side part will take a great deal of effort to force onto the right side of the turret core. The parts do slot into their positions very easily. I did have to clean up a fair bit of flash from the turret core part, mostly around the slots. I'm not sure why they can't just make this all one piece. There's probably some kind of molding reason for it. Maybe it gives better detail. Anyway, it's pretty easy. When attaching the turret front, remember the opening for the gun should sit slightly to the tank's left. The three lumpy things should be on the right side of the front of the turret. We can now move on to installing the gun. I really like that this is moulded with the opening in the end of the barrel. It saves some work drilling it out and potentially getting the hole off centre and such. Just a couple of mould lines to remove before the gun is ready to be glued into place. When doing this, be sure to position the base of the main gun correctly. The machine gun should be to the left of the main gun. This part simply slots in through the back of the turret front like so. The gun can be made to elevate and depress, but I don't feel a need for that option. When gluing the gun solidly in place like I am, you don't need to add this back part, but I added it anyway because I'm a rebel. The main gun has a sort of tab that slots into the recess on the end part. Glue them together and make sure the gun is at whatever elevation you want it to be. There is a tiny bit of a gap there, but it shouldn't be too distracting. Next, I glue the bottom of the turret into place. This part has the ring with the locking tabs that secure the turret to the hull. Of course, I decided to be creative and only have a portion of the action in the frame. Yes, creative. That's it. Now to add a few final details, starting with the commander's hatch. I did have a little bit of trouble with the two halves of the hatch falling too far inwards. I used my knife to gently position them in such a way that I was happy with. Other than that minor issue, they fit well enough. Next, there are two forward-facing vision devices. Again, not entirely sure if these were movable, but they face forward in the pictures, so that's how I've placed them. They are, of course, a little bit fiddly for fat fingers. Then, the searchlight can be glued onto the left side of the turret. This part went on surprisingly easily. I was expecting to have to fiddle about with it. And finally, there are two antennas that go into these two holes here like so. Make sure you've got them nice and straight, and that's it. One Cromwell turret completed. Looks pretty good if you ask me. Attach it to the hull and we've got ourselves one plastic Cromwell cruiser tank in 28mm scale made by Italeri for Warlord Games completed. I do have another Cromwell with which to compare this model. This is the resin and metal version also made by Warlord Games. Of course, this model is obviously painted, which makes it look a lot better than it did unpainted, but we won't let that colour our judgement. If you want to see the video in which I painted this tank, I will link it at the end of the video and in the description below. Looking at the models from the side, the most immediate and obvious differences are that the plastic version has antennas, a cowl over the exhaust, a hole in the muzzle brake, different road wheels, and the front mudguard parts are shaped differently. Other than that, they are both obviously Cromwells and they both look the part. The plastic turret does look to be a little bit taller and have a more obvious angle to it. Also, in my opinion, the tracks on the plastic model look much better, though I do like the wheels on the resin version a little bit more. From the front, it looks as though the plastic model is a little bit wider, though that might just be the camera playing tricks. Most of the same details are there, though the plastic one seems to be missing the round thing, which I think is an air vent on the top of the hull just under the main gun. The resin model lacks headlamp protectors and the lamps themselves are much bigger parts. I can't remember if the protectors were omitted by myself or simply not included. From the rear, the main differences are fairly obvious. The plastic model has the cowl. I can't remember if there was a metal part for the painted model, but there is no metal cowl in my bolt action bits box, so it was probably never included. I really do like the cowl. Other than that, and the fact that they both have quite different detailing on the rear mudguard parts, the differences are minor and not a big deal. From above, it actually looks as though the resin model is slightly wider than the plastic model and also a little bit shorter in length. You can also see that I must have put the driver's hatch in backwards, otherwise they look quite similar. I do like both models. The painted resin and metal model is one of my favourites and is rather special to me on account of it being a gift from one of my favourite people in the world. That said, if I put aside my sentimental feelings and try to be impartial, I would say that the plastic model looks better. It's just more sharply detailed and neater looking. Of course, that's my opinion. I'm sure some will disagree and that's okay. They're both good models of a very cool tank. 
Overall, I'm really pleased with this model. I've not had much luck with Warlord's resin models in the past, but their plastics are really quite good. That said, I do generally prefer to work with plastic models rather than resin and metal, so I might be a little bit biased there. We all have our preferences. This kit was very fun to build and quite easy. I had no real issue following the instructions and everything went together just as it should, though some areas did require a little bit of drilling or scraping. No parts were missing. The build took me about an hour, not counting the time I spent adjusting If anyone knows, let me know in the comments. If they are indeed the same model, it might be worth comparing the prices of either kit. One may be cheaper. Again, I'm not sure. I might be wrong. It has happened before. It is definitely a good kit, and I would be happy to have a whole swarm of these tanks. I haven't played Tank War yet, but I like the idea of a swarm of Cromwells getting around. Maybe bring a Firefly along to take care of some heavier tanks. Good times. On the topic of Cromwells, I really can't wait for Rubicon to come out with their Cromwell. Not that I've heard anything, it's really more wishful thinking. I just really, really want them to make a Cromwell. Rest assured that if and when they do, I will compare it to this plastic Warlord Cromwell and to the resin version too. I hope this video has been interesting or helpful for you. I would love to see any comments, questions or suggestions you might have in the comments section below, especially if you have built this kit before or if you've got a cool painted version you would like to share. I would love to see. If you like the videos I make, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting me via Patreon. A link is in the description and somewhere on this channel. You can also help a lot by sharing this video with all your friends and enemies and anyone that might find it interesting or useful, and by subscribing to this channel and my original Herbert Herbert channel, which has many, many more videos. A link will be in the description below. Thanks for watching. Farewell.